With the increased publicity regarding potential nuclear extortion activities, steps have been taken to provide an expanded capability in the area of nuclear detection instrumentation. While there are many possible variations in the details of a nuclear incident, certain locations are more likely targets than others. The common factors help guide the instrument designer. For example, in the interest of public safety in congested areas, nuclear detection instrumentation has been developed to provide low-profile search capability. By packaging the detection equipment in an ordinary briefcase and transmitting detection information to a small radio receiver carried by the operator, the public never becomes aware that a search is underway. This particular unit meets all the requirements and can be used effectively in public and industrial facilities. Also, with the increased commerce in a variety of nuclear materials, there is growing concern that there could be a terrorist act involving radioactive material in transport. For this reason, the Communications Center of the Energy Research and Development Administration's offices in Albuquerque maintains a constant nationwide contact with its shipments. The same communications net provides a link in the emergency response to nuclear incidents. Nuclear extortion can take a number of forms, and while no such event has yet occurred in the United States, threats have been attempted occasionally. These attempts lend some urgency to the purpose of this film, which is to outline for responsible officials both the nuclear terrorism problem and the response capability developed by the United States Energy Research and Development Administration. The initial stage of any nuclear extortion incident involves an assessment of the credibility of the threat message, which could contain anything from crude sketches or descriptions to more sophisticated documentation and even samples of nuclear material. The assessment will normally be initiated by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which has the basic investigative responsibility for violations of the Atomic Energy Act. However, technical assistance for the initial threat assessment is provided to the FBI by IRTA and the Nuclear Weapon Laboratories through a high-level IRTA headquarters group, the Emergency Action Coordinating Team. The operations center in the Washington area can rapidly marshal IRTA resources. The capability to respond immediately to locate, identify, and assist in the disarming of an improvised nuclear device draws particularly on the skill and experience of the country's nuclear weapons laboratories. There is also the unique hazard potential created by the combination of nuclear materials with high explosives. A realistic appraisal of the magnitude and nature of the dangers and the emergency measures to be taken is a highly complex technical task with which only the nuclear weapons laboratories can deal. Field operations are under the direction of IRTA's Nevada Operations Office, and the deployed unit is known as the Nuclear Emergency Search Team. Because the health and safety of the public is of primary concern, a threat clearly involves not only the FBI and the Energy Research and Development Administration, but also additional government agencies and public officials. Work supported by the Energy Research and Development Administration has been underway for many years to develop equipment to aid in searching for, identifying, and analyzing a terrorist threat. Sophisticated instruments have been designed, built, and tested by the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory at Los Alamos, New Mexico, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory at Livermore, California, and EG&G Laboratories in Las Vegas, Nevada, and Santa Barbara, California. These instruments operate by the detection of penetrating radiation, which will be present whether the threat involves the dispersion of radioactive material by high explosives, or the detonation of an improvised nuclear bomb. In a dispersal device, the radioactive material may be any one of the numerous radioactive isotopes found in industry. For a nuclear explosion, 
the radioactive material can only be plutonium or highly enriched uranium. In most cases, a substantial quantity of chemical high explosive will also have to be present for an effective threat. To aid in your understanding of what may be achievable in the search for a clandestine device, the basic principles involved in these detection techniques are illustrated here. Consider a nuclear device which contains fissionable material and high explosive. Although there is beta ray, X-ray, and alpha particle activity within the fissionable material, from outside the assembly, we can only detect the more penetrating radiation. Gamma rays, represented by the white lines, and neutrons, represented by the yellow lines. If shielding material is placed between the source and a detector, the amount of radiation reaching a detector would be reduced. Shielding may be a part of the device design or result from its location within some structure or building, and thus can be a significant factor in the detectability of a nuclear device. At the detection ranges of the present instruments, the atmosphere also imposes some shielding. Another significant factor in detectability arises from the necessity to find suspect sources in the presence of other natural and man-made radiation sources. For example, Cosmic rays bombard our Earth continuously. Other naturally radioactive materials, such as potassium, uranium, and thorium, occur in soil, stone, and building materials. Numerous radiopharmaceuticals are in common use in medicine, and there are radium dials on older instruments. Industrial X-ray machines and isotopic sources research nuclear accelerators and nuclear reactors. Because detection systems must operate in the presence of background radiation, which can result in false alarms, some are designed to provide an alarm only when the radiation level is at some preset level above the background level. Neutron and gamma detectors provide an electrical pulse every time a neutron or gamma ray is absorbed. The electrical pulses from the detector are then conditioned by suitable electronics and are fed to a logic system, which indicates if a preset warning level has been reached. In the vicinity of a nuclear device or source, the radiation increase is significant, and the detection system then provides an alert. In addition to the alert represented here by the flashing red light, many systems also provide readouts that present radiation levels quantitatively. Neutron detectors are typically helium-3 or boron trifluoride proportional counters moderated by polyethylene and are not as efficient as gamma detectors using sodium iodide scintillators and photomultipliers. Now we illustrate briefly how the detected count rate will vary as a function of velocity and distance. Typical detection ranges for most of the foreseeable situations are tens to hundreds of feet and typical search velocities are from 5 to 80 miles per hour. The detection systems are designed to utilize the most favorable time interval in order to maximize sensitivity or detectability by confining the interval to the time when the signal is present. As we have seen, there is always a background count. The detection system measures the average background level when no signal is present and calculates a warning level based upon this average background. Let's take our detection system in a vehicle, which moves at a typical speed, approximately 35 miles per hour, past three identical sources at different distances, and observe which ones are detected. At this distance, we do not detect the nuclear device, because the count does not exceed the warning level. Here, the vehicle is sufficiently close to the source that the count exceeds the warning level. At this distance, we now see that the count has greatly exceeded the predetermined warning level. Let's see this sequence again. This display is typical of an actual strip chart readout on some of the detection systems. If we wanted to change the search pattern, for example, to obtain more rapid coverage of a given area, we could increase the search velocity. However, this would reduce the detectability. 
If we were to move the same detection system at twice the velocity past the same nuclear devices, the detection system would be within the vicinity of the nuclear devices for only half the time. If the optimum timing is retained, the system determines a new warning level appropriate to the new velocity. Now, as the detection system is moved past the nuclear devices, we see that the detectability is reduced and only the closest source is detected. Therefore, if a helicopter is to give a similar detectability as the automobile at twice the speed, it would need twice the number of detectors as the automobile. Small systems, such as this one, which we have already seen, provide optimum timing for mobile applications as well as for the low-profile search on foot. These systems are also designed for use by personnel with a minimum of instruction. In larger and more sophisticated systems, the operator is in the vehicle and may therefore watch for detection indications. Some systems also allow the collection of recorded data for later analysis on computers maintained and operated in the field. This provides additional assurance that a source is not overlooked, again while keeping a low profile in the interest of public safety. Detection systems may also be used in a stationary mode to monitor roadblocks at access points to specific areas. Packages specifically designed for roadblock applications also have a data transmission capability at distances of up to one mile so that several access points can be monitored simultaneously. It is interesting to note that essentially all of the detection systems when operated at the search speed for which they were designed have about the same detection range. The systems operating at the higher speed can cover more area in a given time, but are more costly. The wide variation in postulated threat environments requires many different types of systems and modes of operation. As a result of this research and development, the nation has state-of-the-art equipment to meet a wide variety of emergency situations requiring a search for a radioactive source or an improvised nuclear device. A new phase in the operation develops when a suspect object is found because an identification of the potential hazard must be made promptly. While several techniques may be applied, one important method of determining what kind of radioactive material is present uses the same type of gamma ray detector used in the search phase but with more sophisticated data analysis equipment. To train personnel, gamma ray spectral data establish the type of radioactive material and allow an estimate of the quantity, both of which are necessary in evaluating the hazard potential. Radiography provides another important means of learning about the internal design of a suspect device. The radiographic image may be recorded in the field by various methods, that is, using a Polaroid film cassette directly, or with a radiographic screen, image intensifier and film, or a TV camera and remote monitor readout. The radiographic source may be either an isotopic source or a portable X-ray machine. This kind of identification equipment and other techniques now under development will allow the IRTA team to assist the military explosive ordnance disposal teams in establishing proper disarming procedures. The unique hazards associated with improvised nuclear devices dictate an extremely conservative approach to disarming. Conventional improvised explosive devices may sometimes be detonated in place. This practice is acceptable when the maximum property damage is predictable and human risk is minimized. However, determination of the maximum area put at risk in a nuclear incident is a far more complex problem and a thorough evaluation by specialists is necessary before the device is disturbed in any way. Research, development, and specialized training in this entire field of activity 
is continuing at the Energy Research and Development Administration's laboratories. As these efforts continue, it is important to remember that significant resources in terms of scientific and technical personnel with specialized equipment and pre-planned procedures are always ready to respond promptly to threats of nuclear terrorism. When it appears that nuclear materials may be involved in terrorist activities, it is essential that public officials, law enforcement officers, or managerial personnel contact the nearest FBI office immediately with all available information. The established channels of communication between the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Energy Research and Development Administration can then operate efficiently to provide a rapid assessment of the situation and the deployment of specialists as required.